Before I get really get started, there's a couple things I have to apologize for. A number of years back in the late 1950s, maybe early 1960s, there was a time when those of you that lived around here ran out of water. Those of you that were on the water main. One of my brothers, in fact, I guess I only got one brother, <laughs> happened to hit this water, this fire hydrant with his car. Knocked it completely over and the whole area was without water, without water for a while. For that I apologize. There's also another time, my brother had a very cushy job up in the top of Observatory Hill. He had this big wheel loader that had tires, well, they were taller than me, so they must have been at least eight feet tall. But he had a real cushy job. But Dad came up there one day and he says, Rob, jump in that loader, drive it down to this other job, and do some real work for a change. Rob was mad, jumps in the loader, throws it in high gear, goes down the observatory road, and wipes out the guardrail, almost the whole way down. So again, I gotta apologize for any disruption we made in you people getting up and down there. I have a picture or two of some of these things. My brother got hold of me. He says, Frank, he says, my buddy Ken Evans and Wendy and his lady friend at the time, Marg Smith, they wanted to go out west, Jordan River Way. Can I borrow your car? I think Robbie's car was still being repaired from the fire hydrant deal, so he didn't have one at that time. I loaned him my car, but I said, Rob, I'm going out tonight, make sure my car is back. Oh, Frank, don't worry, don't worry. So, Rob borrowed my car. I think late in the afternoon, I was working in the shop, and I came back up the house, and Robbie phoned. He says, I'm a little bit late, but he says, I'm on the way home. Okay, Rob. A few minutes later, the phone rings. Mom answers the phone. She doesn't say too much. She says, Frank, you better take this, meaning my dad. Hands dad the phone. He says, yeah. You sure everything's okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, he says, stay there. I'll look after it. We'll pick you up. And this is the condition my car was in when I got it back home. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't go out that night. But... We still may remain friends. Yeah. No, you yeah, haven't, have you? No, it's been... Anyway, a uh, little background, I guess, in my family, or our family. My great-grandfather came from Europe by ship in 1854. He arrived in New Orleans and thought that solid ground around New Orleans was a lot better than the ship was on, so he jumped ship and hung out in New Orleans. It was probably a good choice for him because he spoke both French and German, so, and there was a very high percentage of French people in New Orleans at that time. He um, stayed there and got a job as a deckhand on a Mississippi um, stern wheeler and went up and down the Mississippi as a deckhand, uh, delivering people freight, etc., etc. He disappeared for a while, and in 1865, after the U.S. Civil War, he joined a wagon train and headed west. This was down the Mormon Trail and he ended up in Salt Lake City. 
he um, there met a young lady called Maria Judson, and they soon became a couple. They moved to a little town called Fillmore in Utah and raised four children. One of them died as a very young infant, and they were left with three. My, the oldest one was a girl and then two boys, the youngest being my grandfather. Or our grandfather. Sorry, Rob. Anyway, um, like a lot of us Copleys, our great-grandfather didn't like working for other people. And he heard about this gold available in California, so he packs up his family and heads west from Utah to California. It was a number of years too late. The gold rush was over. Of course, it was over before he even left, but he didn't realize that. He gets to San Francisco and um, has to work, of course. He works there for a while and hears about gold in British Columbia. Everybody tells him, hey, there's gold in BC, head up to British Columbia. So he saves enough money and, and buys passage from San Francisco. The first stop, of course, is Victoria when you're heading to BC. Um, on the way up in that long voyage, he befriends or gets befriended by a Brit who was a landowner in Cowichan Bay. And um, this British gentleman talks him into going farming for him. So he agrees and goes farming in Cowichan Bay. That lasts for a while, and then he hears about homesteading in Shawnigan, um, Cobble Hill area. So great-grandfather heads to that area, and starts a homestead, and builds a house, clears it. I do have a picture of his first house. Anyway, uh, yeah, grandfather settled in Shawnigan, and our great-grandfather settled in the Shawnigan Cobble Hill area and uh, went logging and firewood. At that time, railroads were being built on Vancouver Island, not just the NN, but um, logging railroads, so there was quite a demand for timber, etc., etc. He had four more children. They had four more children after they moved to Canada. And, uh, but after the four children started to grow up, grandma, great-grandmother Maria and great-grandfather split up and our great-grandmother went back to Utah. The three young, younger boys ended up in Utah with her, and they worked back and forth for a number of years. Ending up, they all ended up back in BC because, my goodness, it's the best place in the world to live, especially southern Vancouver Island. My grandfather was of age, and he went into the logging business too, and uh, and the wood business. And strangely enough, his family split up. And my grandmother took six children, four boys and two girls, down to Victoria here. And this is where our real good history begins in the Victoria area. There's nothing like this part of the world. Dad and my uncle Norm formed a company called Douglas Fuel, and they sold cordwood, mostly to commercial buildings like Hudson Bay and the other buildings downtown, who still heated with wood. And those of you that don't remember, cordwood was usually Douglas fir, four, cut in four foot lengths, 
and split like firewood. A few advantages to that were it was easier to handle, quicker to handle for commercial buildings, and even for private people. You could stack two rows of cordwood down a deck of a truck, made it eight feet wide, which was perfectly legal. And if you had a 12-foot deck, stack them four feet high, and you had three perfect cords. But the advantage was that people could see what they're buying, not wood that's thrown in a big closed truck box. So you paid a little bit more, but you got premium grade wood, seemingly. My father kept telling me that. Anyway, um, my father and my uncle went in business for themselves, and then the Second World War started, and the big demand was for logs, particularly Douglas fir. My dad and my uncle closed down Douglas Fuel and formed Copley Brothers. And they logged up in the Highland District, going back and forth up here most days, because at that time we lived, Robbie and I were born, and we lived down in Inverness Street. So Dad and Uncle Norm would drive up here almost every day to work because their logging was in the Highland District. And eventually they accumulated about 1,200 acres up there of private timber. And they logged for 20-odd hmm, years. Not steady, but off and on. During this time of traveling back and forth here, they got to know a number of people. And one of their big families that they made, became good friends with was, of course, the Chu family, which is not too far down the road from here. John Chu was, I think, Dad's favorite. And uh, Dad was probably instrumental in talking John into going into business for himself and going into a business that was competitive with my dad. But that's what the way Dad was. He enjoyed that competitiveness, and he enjoyed John's friendship. John and his sisters were quite young at the time, and periodically Dad would see them on the side of the road going or to or from school, and he would take them to or from school. And at that time, too, we, the, the locking got to be quite a big event for us, and um, Dad and Uncle Norm arranged to have booming grounds in Mackenzie Bay, which is almost opposite Mount the um, Bamberton. And in the summer months, we lived in the bay. They built a shack down on the beach, and Mom, Robbie, my sister Pat at that time, and I would live down there while they were booming logs. My uncle Norm was into boats, and he had a boat built, and he would use it for uh, pushing the logs around, doing whatever is necessary, and booming, and also for reclaiming logs that are lost during storms. During this period of time, too, the two brothers were very involved in designing new machinery. Make it easier. Logging is a tough business. We don't like those cross-cut saws. We don't like those drag saws. So they were always constantly looking for new equipment, new things, new ways of doing it. They got together with Basil Oldfield, which Basil, or Barney as some people called him, was quite a good designer. Excellent, actually. No hell as a welder, but he got by. Um, 
and he built a lot of machines for Dad and Uncle Norm. Just amazing, you know. It, stuff. Dad would buy a, come across a bear crawler tractor, and Basil would build blades for it, and just everything. Just equip it the way we needed it in to do the logging. Of course, all this equipment in the logging business then morphed into the excavating business, and pretty soon the two brothers were in the excavating, road building, you name it, and they did it. Um, pretty soon we had a crew of quite a number. Any of you interested, there are some photographs. There's one of our machines with our crew at that time, probably a dozen men, at least there. Um, and as time went on, the war ended, and Uncle Norm and Dad were both looking to move away from Inverness Street. Things were booming in British Columbia. Houses were being built, soldiers coming home, needed housing. Logs, the mills needed logs. Dad, Uncle Norm found acreage down on Interurban and on one side and bordered on Grange. I think it was Grange on the other side. He built a house. And then there's an interesting thing. As I said, Uncle no uh, Norm and Dad were always looking for new ways of doing things. Well, his wife, our Aunt Lil, got him to paint a room in the basement of his house. She wanted it painted. Finally, the house was empty. Uncle Norm had no choice, but he had to go and paint. Well, these little paint brushes that he had were not the greatest thing for painting. Uncle Norm thought there's a better way. We had spray equipment for painting the tractors, etc. So we went and gathered up all the spray equipment the mask, the gear, the whole works, and turned up the furnace, got the house nice and warm, and started spraying this paint on the walls, the ceiling, and beautiful. But he forgot one thing. A hot air furnace sucks the cold air, warms it, and then spreads it through the house. It not only sucked the cold air, but it sucked all the paint over spray as he was painting that room and spreading it throughout the whole house. Every room in the house was covered in paint spray. Yeah. My aunt came home, and I think we could hear her all the way to our house, screaming at him. And uh, next thing we know, Uncle Norm is quietly sitting in our kitchen. I think he was afraid to go home and face the music again. And eventually Aunt Lil got over it, I think. And then in 1951, my dad found a farm for sale, not far from here, a, few mile, a couple of miles from here. It's about 120 acres, 120, was it? Anyway, acres, and it was a, an ex-dairy farm, wasn't it, Rob? Yeah. Kind of. And um, it, But it was perfect. Dad checked it out. It was just exactly what he wanted. It had the acreage where he could put his machinery. But the big thing, it had a long stretch that ran from Man Avenue down to Cary Road, and he could carve an airstrip down it. This is what he has been looking for since the 40s. The place was four miles from the city hall as the crow flies, so it was close to town. It had eight, an 1,800 foot stretch where the airstrip could go. Um, perfect. So we carved an airstrip out of it. And I have a little blurb here on how it was done. That comes out of the paper, newspaper. Unfortunately, a lot of our photographs disappeared, in fact, most of them. I, don't, I have very, very little in this era. Um, so I had to do some scrounging to get this. 
but it was perfect, as I said. And at the same time, Dad and Uncle Norm had a major job down at BC Forest Products sawmill in town. And BC Forest was expanding considerably, and they're building a brand new plywood plant. Dad and Uncle Norm did all the excavating for it, and it was huge. There was demolition, there was excavating, there was all kinds of work down there. And I remember, as a, I was quite young, but I remember going down there, and these lumber carriers, and I think they were called Ross carriers, was the common name for them. And they were screaming all down this site, and BC Forest said, I don't care what you do, but these Ross carriers have the right of way because lumber has to go out. And they had to put up with this. But the big thing, too, is BC Forest, of course, being in the, wood, in the lumber business, lumber was cheap for them. They supplied the lumber, of course, for their own building. And when they put forms up for concrete, that lumber came off, and they just wanted to get rid of it, get it out of the way. Didn't reuse it. They didn't <coughs> spend money getting people to pull the nails, clean it, put it back up in the framing, get rid of it. So Dad and Uncle Norm put it in the trucks, and every day they trucked it out to our farm. We had stacks of lumber, plywood, whatever. Dad found a few people from that were retired from this area, and they wanted some work. They wanted a friendship of working together. They weren't ready for complete retirement, so they came down, and Dad made a deal with them. They pulled the nails. They cleaned the lumber. They sorted it, stacked it. So six foot two by fours were here, eight foot one over there, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and worked out beautifully. Mom and Dad then wanted a new house built on our newly acquired farm. And they hired George Farmer, Farmer Construction, which at that time was <coughs> the premium builder. And George and Dad were very good friends. And Elsie. Um, so they designed and built our house. And they used all that XBC Forest lumber for uh, the framing of our house. And just a marvelous old house, and it's still a marvelous old house, still down there. I also have a picture of the area of what it looked like when Dad was finished doing the, the um, airstrip and our house. And those of you that are interested can have a look at that as well. Um, I also have a picture, of course, of what it looks like today. A mass of houses. The whole Northridge subdivision was our farm. And I'm supposed to get down, Daryl says, of <laughs> getting my head cut off. Well, that's all right, Daryl. <laughs> um, on our little farm there, Dad... Uh, he was always full of bright ideas. I loved the man, but... Anyway, he got Uncle Norm and I think my brother, and they went up to 100 Mile and they bought beef cows. Hereford Shorthorn Cross. 25 of them. Brought them down and we put them on the farm. Um, I hated them right from the start because I'm not a farmer. My brother just loved them and they would follow him around the countryside. And, but these big Herefords were not used to fence, I mean, fenced in 100 acres. And sometimes they would knock the fence down. And luckily, like just about every other farm in the countryside, we had a nice black and white border collie who was extra clever, smarter than us. And when those cows got out, and maybe Bill Edge or one of the edges down there would phone us and say, hey, your cows are out, that collie would be down there 
getting them back in before we even arrived at the scene. Just amazing, old pal. Those 25 beef cows pretty soon turned into 50. And we had more cows than, oh my gosh. And the more cows we got, the more I worked in the shop to stay clear of them. I just, nah. anyway, my brother just loved them and he was. But dad also got the idea that, of course we needed, we had all these cows, we had to have water. And we had to have water in the right place. So he obtained water rights for Colquitt's Creek. Or I guess it's Colquitt's River, I think is the correct name now. And we had a huge big pump and irrigation system with three inch, four inch aluminum pipe that we carried around and put wherever we needed it and big sprinklers. And the airstrip was used for pasture when he wasn't flying on it. Um, yeah, it was marvelous. He also decided that that creek was just a mess in some areas and it was old tires and batteries and tin cans and garbage. So for quite a long time, Dad's made the guys, you know, not made, but asked our men when they got off early to go down to the creek and take an excavator and do whatever and clean up that creek and, and put it back in the shape it's supposed to be. He also, times, and it was usually my brother would say, Dad, hey, the water level in that creek is going down. It, it's not enough water in it right now for the fish. And Rob was a good a fisherman. And uh, so Dad would phone somebody, and I think it was the city of Victoria he'd phone, and they'd open the dam up at, the gates up at Beaver Lake here and raise the level back up where it should be. Dad wouldn't take no for an answer if they said they needed water for other reasons. No, I've got water rights. You must supply me water. Didn't really need it at the time or sometimes, but he didn't want that creek to go down. He also built a big pond right alongside the creek, and it's still there. It's hard to find, but it's still there. And that way, the some of the fish would always find, even in the hot summer, they'd find a place where they could get deep water and cool. Really interesting. And in winter months, we could use it for skating. And again, my brother involved, skating on the pond. He wasn't always bad. Where are you, Rob? <laughs> ah, yeah, we love you. Um, yeah, the place was just, oh, it was, it had, the, this area was just had so much going for it, for young people, teenagers, for, um, that everything you wanted. At that time, the reservoirs up at the lake there where the parking is now, and you could take your bike and whip around those concrete reservoirs. And of course we helped fill them in. I think Ideal Fuel trucked in there for, I don't know, 10 years maybe. Huh? Yeah, Calcutt's Creek to fish in. Again, oh, it's just an amazing, amazing, amazing existence. I have a picture, again, my brother who's fishing in Colquitt's Creek, and this is after it was cleaned up, and that was with Askey? Yeah, Jim Askey. Jim? Jim Askey, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, during our time there, we had helicopters. The Canadian Navy came in and used our place periodically for some type of maneuvers that they wanted to try. I, a picture of a helicopter right outside our kitchen window. Really into it. Our youngest sister, Helen May, was into horses. 
There used to be a ranch, kind of a small ranch up on Oldfield Road called Dogwood Arabians at that time. Had a prize stallion, Asatel was his name. Had a long Arab name, but I can remember the Asatel part. And we, Helen May had a English saddlebred breed horse. I think that's what it was. And the two bred her with Asatel, so she had an, what's called an Anglo Arab. Those that you know, probably people in here know more about horses than I do. But anyway, that was supposed to be prized and beautiful. Had a little foal called Laura's Glory, and it was just the cheekiest little thing. It grew up, there was no way that if that little foal wanted out of a, pen, a fenced area, there's no way that anyone could keep it in. She would find a way. may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but she'd work and find a way through a wire fence. The little thing, my grandmother and grandfather lived with us in the basement suite of our house. Mom and mom's father and mother. My grandmother, always with an apron around, just loved to hang out the washing on a clothesline. The dryer wasn't good enough for her. This little filly of Helen Mays used to like to pull the clothespins off the line after she carefully put the clothes on. My grandmother would get so mad, she'd take the apron off, get out of here, get out, Laura, go away, and chase the little thing away. And Laura would go around the house, and I think she just put her head around and waited until Grandma Nana went back in the house, and she'd go pull the clothespins off. This went on for probably over a year until the little thing grew up enough to stay away, but just the cutest little thing. Um, there are some other interesting things on that farm. Just love. One I remember, and this one is me. I looked out our field, and we had a grain field where we grew wheat and vetch, or oats and vetch, down the bottom for the cattle in the winter months. And it was cut, left with a stubble, and looked down there in the morning, and holy gosh, there's half a dozen beautiful caught pheasants there. I gotta get one of those. So at that time we, you know, you didn't mind shooting the odd pheasant. It wasn't a thing not to do. Anyway, I grabbed my brother had a shotgun that I'd never used before. It was a Winchester 25 or 12 or 25. Anyway, I grabbed this Winchester, grabbed a couple of shells for it, put them both in, and charged down. Got a bead on one, bang, got him. And just as I shot, the Saanich police car came down, carry road. Oh my good God. We'd been warned about this before. And I ran up, I thought, maybe he didn't see me, so I ran up in the house. I've got the shotgun in my hand. And of course, I'm always, you know, we've been around guns all our life, so I'm never pointing it at a place where it's gonna cause too much damage. But, unfamiliar with this gun, I somehow fired it off in the kitchen. <laughs> at that time, Mom had a chrome table set with red, upholstery on it. Well, it went through the back of one, a hole about this size of the front as it went through. Exited, the hole was about that big. Hit the wall and put a hole about that big inside the wall. Went outside, we had cedar siding on the house, and man, it was splintered like this. Mom could smell the smoke and heard the noise, of course. She was on the far end of the house. 
she would not come out to see what was wrong. I don't, and I think she went out the front door, and got dad. Dad came in the back, he looks at it. Hmm. Learn anything from this? And he says, I guess you're gonna learn how to fix it too, aren't you? And he walks out, just like that. Well, I didn't, I knew nothing about fixing plaster, drywall, or whatever it was. I knew nothing about fixing a siding. The chair, I could take down to the upholstery shop and have it repaired, but good. Anyway, I did my best, but Dad had an old carpenter working for him uh, periodically, quite often, actually, and he finally felt sorry for me and got the carpenter to fix my damage. Pardon? You know, that I was trying to remember what became of that pheasant. Uh, I can't remember. I don't know. I, you know, I don't think... The police just carried on. Oh, they were... They were yeah, they were pretty good. I know. I, I got stopped by a Constable Ledson. I'll never forget his name. Constable Ledson. I almost drove into a police car, actually. I was about 16. And he stopped me. Come over and asked for my license. I gave it to him. And he says, Frank? And I said, yeah. He says, uh, I should give you a ticket for this. And he gave me a long lecture of what I was doing wrong and everything. And I'm pretty upset. He says, look. He says, I'm not going to give you a ticket this time. But he says, I am driving from here down to your house, and I'm going to have a word with your father. Well, my God. I said, please, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, he did not go down and see my dad. I was scared to go home because I knew I'd, my license would be pulled and my car would be parked and, uh, for a suitable length of time. But Constable Les Ledson never... Never did that. He never went and saw my dad. But I'll tell you what, he just cleaned up my act as far as driving was concerned home from high school. Um, one other Sunday. Dad loved company. Mom never knew who was coming, he was going to bring home for dinner. I don't think it ever bothered her. In fact, I think my wife is the same way. I just, um, if dad met somebody and he wanted them to come home, they came home. Mom would say, ooh, I guess we got to put some more potatoes on tonight, huh? And so we always had people at our house, particularly on Sundays. Dad just, he couldn't go a Sunday without having somebody there. He also was very, very proud of his airplane. We kept it at home, just like we kept a car at home. We had the plane parked there. Um, nice, shiny, silver, and red. Cessna 180, beautiful aircraft, four passenger. If anything was wrong with it, he immediately had it fixed. There was never anything wrong with that aircraft. He uh, decided that the upholstery was getting just a little bit shabby. So okay, it wasn't going to be flying much. Weather was turning sour. So we angled it into our shop. We had a huge shop, so he could put a plane in it, easy. And one end and still have room to work on the machinery. The doors were a little too narrow because uh, for the wings, so you had to jockey it in and get it in. And he had the plane in, and we took all the upholstery out, had the guy come, upholstery guy, and we took all the upholstery out and took it, sent it down to be redone. This Sunday, he had somebody new at our house, I, I can't remember who it was, and he wanted to show him the aircraft. So, Dad comes down, and I'm busy working on one end of the shop on my little 32 Ford coupe, and 
I didn't pay too much attention. The next thing I know, Dad, oh, Dad asked me, he says, come here, give me a hand, we want to push this out. So we pushed the Cessna out to one of the doorways. The wings were inside the shop. The engine was outside. It's fine. So I go back to playing with my car, and Dad talking to this gentleman. And next thing I know, he's firing this plane up. And the noise is kind of loud in that shop. But I look up, and the plane is slowly moving ahead. He must have had the throttle pushed in a little bit too much to, or, and opened a little bit too much and the brake not on and he's yelling at me and I couldn't, took me a moment or two to twig on to what was going on. So I go running over to the plane, try and jump in it to put the brakes on and, and stop it from hitting the wall of our shop. Well, with no seats in it, and just a perfectly flat floorboard like this, only polished aluminum, I just slid back, couldn't get the brakes on soon enough, and bang, the wings hit the door post. Well, it put two nice square dents in the leading edge of the wings. Of course, father screams at me, and... and my fault for not getting there soon enough. I accepted that because that was the way Dad was. But two minutes later, he would walk away and put his arm around you, and it was all over. So good friends of ours, Hugh Thomas was his name, was probably the best aircraft engineer in the country at the time. In fact, his Gray site is right behind us here. Just a fine gentleman. He was had the probably the highest credentials, aircraft engineering credentials that you could possibly get. He worked in the U.S. I think he was dual citizen, wasn't he? Yeah. And he worked in Texas. And what happened down in Texas? He got a a special project, and it was right at the end, a special plane he had built for this company, right at the end, and they were just painted it. The paint was still wet. A big storm came up, blew sand all through the hangar where he was, and just ruined the paint job on this plane that he had. And anyway, he, he just said, that's it, and he quit right on the spot. He said, I'm going. And he owned an island up here, so he came up to BC, and Soon worked at Pat Bay Airport. But he became real good friends with Dad, and he came and he says, okay, he says, we gotta get the wings off, and he came down and supervised getting the wings off, and we, I think Robbie loaded them up and, and took them out to the airport, and, and Hugh Thomas says, I'll fix them up and get them for you. Well, a period of time went by, I don't know how long, and Hugh phoned up and says, the wings are ready, bring them back down. Well, the leading edge of an aircraft is, you know, it's aluminum, but shaped like that, and this square dent in it. Now, how in the heck could he get it out? Dad asked him, I asked him, everybody asked him, and he wouldn't, he'd just smile and walk away. He says, that's my secret. So I don't know, to this day, whether he could take those dents out. I don't think so, but anyway, the wings were looking brand spank new, and of course, he's supervised putting the wings back on and signed the necessary papers that it was airworthy again, and away we went. Um, but our whole growing up years was full of these things. Every single day was something that we could look forward to. Robbie and I, we got just about everything that we wanted, needed, wanted. We had dad and mom made the opportunity there. We had to work for everything. We both, Rob was probably one of the best cat drivers around. 
excellent. He had a tough job. Rob would go out there and do it. Dad knew that if Robbie was on the job, that it would be done, finished, and done properly. He was also a good truck driver, a little careless at times, but no, he got everything done. I worked basically in the shop. I think I was good too. I could weld and did weld from about 14 years of age on up. Even in grade four or five, I would come home and I'd practice welding. When we lived on Inverness Street, Dad would save all the short welding rods that he'd half used. And I'd come home and every night I would practice welding. Um, so we worked with e for everything, but we had the opportunity to turn that work into things that we wanted too. Here's some of the a picture of one of the jobs. Again, that's my brother. My gosh, I, all these. Anyway, oh, I'm not supposed to stand. Here's a picture of Robbie. That's a landing barge that he's loading equipment on, and we're going to do an, a job at an island. We built airstrips on Sydney Island, on Hudson Island, Pierce. No. Yeah. Just all around the countryside, and and Rob was always at, always there on these jobs. Because, of course, he was one thing. He was single, so he didn't mind being away, and he was good. I'm, I hate to admit it, but he was excellent. I don't hate to admit it, Rob. Um, here's another job that Rob did. If the picture's not good, but it's an article in the paper. We had a job down at dockyard. And we had to place rock underwater. For some reason, I can't even remember why now. Was it a slipway? Okay, and. Um, it, right, right, that's right. And anyway, they only paid us for the work that was done right. If the rock went in the wrong place, we didn't get paid for it. So it was very important that everything, bucket load of stuff, was placed. Robbie was a skin diver. And so he was down there in his skin diving outfit, showing them where to place this rock. Worked perfectly. Little anecdote down there, every truck, every piece, every time you went in there, you had to get these darn guards at the gate had to let you in and let, check your credentials or do this and do that. So this was getting expensive and annoying. And so one of the guys down there said, look, why don't we just open up the gate 100 yards down here and cut a fence open, and then you can go in and out at will. Did that. The guards could see us, but it, it was out of their jurisdiction, so they didn't bother. So the trucks then could come in and out at will. Dad also was a great... Man, for he made lots of money in this Royal Oak, Saanich area, Victoria area. But he also believed that if you make lots of money, you've got to give some of it back. I think our equipment built the beach at Beaver Lake at no charge to the community. We worked on the Black Swan. Yeah. We worked on several beaches at Elk Lake and trucked in sand. Now, Saanich would supply the material, the sand, but Dad supplied bulldozers, trucks, whatever was needed, and did it free of charge. We never charged for doing a park. We 
he cleaned up, as I say, Colquitt's Creek as much as we could. And again, that was for his pleasure. He loved to see that water running and the fish in the creek. And he liked to see the smile on Robbie's face when he came home with a trout about six inches long, but I thought. So I think my great-grandfather made the right choice. He was looking for gold, and I think finding southern Vancouver Island was worth a heck of a lot more than any of that yellow stuff. I think I know the life we have lived here and the life we're going to live is just unbelievable. People would, I could talk for days and people would not believe the, the great things that we've seen and, and things we've been able to do with our life. You know, my, oh God, here we go again, Rob. Do you know, I believe, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm sure Dad told me. My brother, about 15 years old, I guess, 16 maybe, wanted to make money for, to buy a car and other things. And he was a real outdoorsman. Around here, in this area back then, there were several mink farms. I don't know where the thought came from, but Rob wanted to become a trapper. Dad said, okay, if you're gonna go trapping, you're gonna do it right. So we went down to, he went down to Victoria, applied for a trapper's license. I believe Rob had the last legal trapping license in this area. He trapped all along Conquitz Creek. Now, those days, don't forget, I mean, now trapping is, ooh, we don't even discuss it. People don't wear furs. But in those days, fur coats were the thing to have. These escaped mink did, you know, considerable damage for the fish and whatnot. And a pelt was worth about 40 bucks, a mink pelt, wasn't it? A good, yeah. So they're well worth getting. Muskrat were also around, but they were, yeah. But, <laughs> but he had to do them, do it right. And there was hours spent, and you got stuff in the mail from oh, and, and he would have these pelts, and he'd clean them and do whatever you had to do, stretch them out, and I. Oof. Anyway, and then he would collect enough and send them to Vancouver for the fur auction, wasn't it? And then eventually the money would come back to you, less the commission that they made on the, the auction. But the smell, oh my good God. I had a, a un my uncle Guy, who was in the Navy, gave me this beautiful ammunition box made of Mahogany, beautiful Honduras mahogany, just a big thing. Anyway, Rob confiscated it, and for his pelts, well, even after he finished the trapping business, I bet it took me five years to get rid of the smell of that. Oh. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, the chicken farm is like. Mm. <laughs> anyway. Um, It was a, quite an interesting, interesting life there. Um, we enjoyed every minute of it, almost every minute of it, I think, didn't we? Um, and I hope I haven't bored you too much. It's, I have a question. Where's that house that you built on the um, Man Avenue area there on the farm? Where's what? Oh, okay, um, if you come in off Kerry Road, yeah. and you come straight up by Copley, there's a Copley Park, Park on, yeah. the, on the right side, and if you went straight up, 
you'll see a cedar house, one story house, hidden away, but there's other houses around it now, right at the end of the road, before you turn right along the park. Uh -huh. yeah. Before you go over the bridge, or the little bridge over the creek? Yeah. Uh, there's a bridge right down on Cary Road. Oh, wait a minute, okay, yeah. Car yeah. There's a bridge there, you go over the bridge, and you go up, and you go straight up, and there's a little cul-de-sac, and the house is in the cul-de-sac. You have to go up, you have to get up there and really look for it, it's because it's surrounded now by other houses. I've been up there, t we've been up there twice, I think, maybe, or haven't we? Pardon? Copley Park is there, yeah, there's two Copley Parks in the... Oh, right. We went to Fillmore to see grandmother's, great grandmother's grave site and do a little research in the museum there. And we found a coffee park in Fillmore too, yeah. It's quite interesting, I forgot. Anyway, um, that's my...